first Okay, time. so <clears throat> before we get started with today's uh, session, Graham and I are trying to um, investigate some alternative opportunities uh, to provide some testing options. And ultimately it comes down to how many and where and when. And so those are the things that we're trying to get an idea of. So I'm gonna throw a poll up real quick. And if you could please answer these three questions um, related to where you are um, and what well, may or may not work for you. One other thing aside from that, if, if, you, if you did not check that you intend to test and that's changed for some reason, certainly let Christy and I know that too, because we have other communications we're doing just with that smaller group that we want to include you in if you are uh, planning to test and you weren't when you registered. Right. Rosie, what day of the week would you be looking at? Likely a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, one of those three days. Okay. So M Milford is just outside of Lincoln. So that's a little bit more of an Eastern Nebraska question. Yep. And Scott but, is in the panhandle. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and, and Scott's Bluff isn't a for sure thing, but somewhere out West, we're looking into the option of having a proctored exam uh, for folks in central and Western Nebraska as well. Right. So we need, we need to know how many people are serious about testing and where, and uh, you know, which week is gonna work better for you. Well, the 1st of April would be Good Friday. So any day prior to that, during that last week of March. Okay. Um, and the next week, well, naturally it keeps jumping back from week to month and. Yeah. In April, the first full week after Easter is pretty much open for me. So I imagine I would, you mean the first- What day is Easter on? The fourth. Okay. So yeah, the week of the fifth, Monday's the fifth. That so would probably- It would be that full week. Yeah. Or um, the week prior, which is kind of the split week of March and April. And I know uh, City of Lincoln folks are sharing screens in some cases, so we'll be in touch with you guys on getting more uh, details on folks that are attending, but you know, under all under one registration. So I guess I could go to Milford too, but it would be easier for Scotts Bluff. And, and, and everybody's still got the Pearson View Centers as an option. There, there's just an extra fee to, to use their facility and test there. So we're trying to you know, eliminate as many barriers for you guys as possible and, and so that we can get you guys testing soon while the information's all fresh in your mind. Because I know it's going to get busy once it warms up. Probably talk to you later on this, but I looked at that uh, link to the the uh, testing situation, and all I could see is where I could spend money on buying other books. Don uh, sent you the the wrong link. I'll go look at that because I caught it in another email. Okay. That was probably my fault. I apologize. Okay. Yeah, we, maybe in the chat, Chrissy, you could put a link to that becoming certified page that we put together with all the all the other links for folks for NAA, yes. ISA. I will go hunt all that down. <clears throat> all right. I don't want to take any more time away from Graham. If you have any other information or any other feedback uh, related to these three questions, please shoot us an email. Um, so that way we can take that into consideration as we try, like Graham said, we're just trying to find as many ways that we can help 
make the process easier for you um, and more convenient. So thank you guys. All right, Graham, go ahead. All right. Very good. Okay, guys, um, I love covering this topic. Uh, on one hand, there's a lot of stuff here, but the book didn't have nearly as much to cover. I mean, there's lots to talk about with pruning outside of the scope of the ISA manual. So uh, just gonna start with a few thoughts because we can't really talk about pruning and the way we handle trees in the city without going all the way back um, to, oh, first of all, credit. Um, a lot of these slides come from Dr. Ed Gilman, at least in terms of the actual pruning stuff that we'll get into uh, after this first slide set. If you uh, look up Ed Gilman, he's out of Extension in Florida. And he's got a great website with lots of handouts, PowerPoints that are all uh, available for anybody to use. So you could check that out if you wanted more information or you're looking for a handy little infographic on young tree pruning or planting or on and on. There's lots of topics there. So just a quick Google of Ed Gilman will get you right to his page pretty quick. So there's giving credit to a lot of those slides that you're going to see today. But we want to talk about the African savanna, kind of where we, we sort of came from. So uh, if we look at this timeline here, we see that our hominid ancestors emerged in the African savanna about 6 million years ago. By the time you get to proper Homo sapiens, we're only about a quarter of a million years ago, about 250 um, years, 250,000 years ago. So recently some research was, was studying soils in Africa in order to determine how long ago there were different types of ecosystems throughout uh, Central Africa. And it was believed for a long time that it was only about 2 million years ago that the savannah started to become more dominant over the forests that were there before. And recent research is showing that it's much more likely that the savanna was in place throughout our, our whole hominid evolution. And that this is the savanna context is what we really evolved out of more so than a forest environment. So this means that uh, the top right depiction shows sort of what, what we were accustomed to throughout these, these uh, million, millions of years. A, a grassland with, with sparse trees, not a real dense forest cover. And what does that mean for, uh, for anything that we're talking about today? Well, the, uh, the, the savanna and the trees in it provided shade, of course, and, and shelter as well. Oftentimes the trees on the savanna indicate where a water source is located. So that was really important for survival is knowing how to find water. There were also trees that provided food. This is the monkey bread fruit on the baobab tree. A lot of you have probably seen photos of baobabs. Uh, they get these really, really, really wide cylindrical trunks that are photographed quite a bit. The savanna would also, and the water sources would attract other animals, which were of course their own food source for hunting. And then all the useful materials that would come from trees as well. This was all really important for us as we began to develop civilization, began to congregate in larger groups and establish towns, agriculture, and the cities that we all know of today. So you say, well, that's all well and good, Graham, and you're really clever, but we have cities now. Uh, we can turn on the water when we need to. We can use the air conditioning to control the, the climate in our homes. We have grocery stores to go get our food from, and we have, how, well, I'm guessing most of us don't have houses like this necessarily, but we all have homes that are uh, protective and climate controlled and all that sort of thing. So we don't need trees anymore. We can just throw that out and, and they're not important for cities. But trees do have a lot of benefits to offer. And, and I'm not gonna spend time going over all of these with you because you guys know most of the tree benefits that are really common and well-known, the, the shade, 
the carbon sequestration, the stormwater capture, that sort of thing. But there are a few that I do want to highlight here before we get into pruning itself. Trees actually fight crime, certain types of crime that are opportunistic in nature. In other words, they sort of require that nobody's around and maybe there's very little planning involved. There are, when we improve the walkability of, of our communities and we have places that are pleasant to walk to the park, walk to the store, walk to school, then those environments and those neighborhoods are gonna have more people out and about. There's gonna be more eyeballs on the street and that is going to suppress some types of opportunistic crime, uh, vandalism, things of that nature. Not everything, uh, if someone's set to, to uh, harm somebody else, uh, there's not much a tree is gonna do about that unless their ability to improve the walkability and the likelihood of other people being around is gonna make a difference. But trees do also improve our business districts. This is a very common picture in most of our Nebraska communities in the downtown uh, main strip through um, rural communities throughout Nebraska. And a lot of those business districts are not doing very well. And if we have well-established tree canopy in these business districts, research shows that people will spend as much as 10 to 12% more time and money at those businesses. So it's an important part of the viability of those businesses. It's not what's gonna make or break things for any one community, but it's a piece of the puzzle. And usually what happens instead is these, um, a lot of these small towns will take a large city mentality of maximizing parking as if that were actually the problem and sacrifice really important ground space that could be used to establish trees in order to get a couple more cars parked in front of these businesses. As you know, trees improve air quality and they mitigate urban heat island and ambient air temperatures, particularly in these, in these really dense urban downtown districts where it's very hard to get trees to grow, but when, and when we can do that, it's gonna make a big difference in, you know, again, just like we are talking about with businesses, how, how desirable it is to be out and about instead of ducking into a building and the air conditioning as soon as possible. Uh, the trees also help us heal faster. Research shows that people in, in a hospital, just with a view of a green space, even if they're sequestered to their bed and they can't get up and get outside, even if they can simply see a green space from their hospital window, they're discharged on average quicker and uh, they use less pain medication while they are staying in the hospital. And so this, these are all real public health issues. And I know everyone's tired of seeing this picture, but in an era where we're in the middle of a pandemic that is cardiovascular and pulmonary in nature, meaning it has to do with blood flow and breathing, all these benefits become even more important. So what I'm getting at here is that even though we have replacements for a lot of the benefits that trees provided throughout our evolutionary history, trees are still city infrastructure. We have um, lots of people that, that need the benefits of these trees and we have to be sure that with the tax dollars that we spend that we're making them equitably ac accessible to everybody regardless of whatever demographics and economic status that they have. So the same way we think about our roads, our public transportation, our sewers, our water, we should be thinking about our green infrastructure, our trees and our park space as synonymous with these things, as, as public benefits that, that we need to provide for. And I would also argue that internet connectivity is uh, crucial to modern life and should be uh, guaranteed and made accessible to everybody. Uh, and everybody pays their fair share the same way they would with a water bill or anything else, but that our municipalities could and should be making sure that that's available and accessible to everybody. But trees is really what we're focusing on today. So I pulled a picture. This is a stock image right off the internet. This is a linden forest certainly back east somewhere, maybe not New England, but somewhere in that neck of the woods. And I'm wondering if anybody has any, you know, general impressions about what you notice about this photo. What strikes you about this image? Feel free to unmute yourself if you have any thoughts to share about what you think, what of, you this think of this picture. The density. Yeah, right? Who is that? 
Aaron. Aaron, thanks Aaron. so much. So th these trees aren't on 40 foot centers, are they? Um, here, here's another picture of Linden. This is where we're spaced out a little bit further. These were probably planted out in rows, a little bit closer to what we would expect to see out of Linden if they were planted in the streets um, with parking or driveways in between and hardscape that's sort of preventing them from having that, that tighter density. But the point still being that left to their own devices, Linden is a species and a genus, I guess, that is adapted to a forest setting where they're grown tight, they're close together and tight. They have strong leaders, not a lot of small lateral branches off to the side, you know, light penetration, air circulation, all that is playing into the structure that they develop in their natural context. So when we take that tree and we wanna use it in the city and plant it as an individual, we're going to have to fight the structure that it, that it wants to ultimately take on. And so we get a linden that looks much more like this on the right. This is a tree that I managed for a number of years when I was in the private sector and, and really enjoyed. So very different between the natural context that we take linden out of and the form that it develops uh, here on the right hand side when we plant it as an individual tree. Sorry, that's me. Oh, come on. Apologies, guys. So when we're pruning trees, what we're really doing is we're trying to combat some of the poor structure that trees develop when we plant them and grow them in a really different context than what they've evolved for over, over thousands and millions of years. Um, so here, here's, again, the tree on the left is growing on the street where it's going to want to have lots of different leaders. There's light penetration from all sides. The tree is not competing for sunlight the way it would in a forest. And on the right is a far back view of that same tree that I showed you the interior of a minute ago. Almost looks more like a conifer, right? Across the, the way is a spruce tree and the linden saying, hey, I can look pretty coniferous as well. Watch this and has this real gumdrop sort of form to it. The tree has since been limbed up and I was really sad to see that because I really like seeing the, the, this form in this particular linden, but uh, a very different structure than what they get in the forest. So that's ultimately the takeaway that I wanted to, to share with you guys. Um, so, so that tree was a book that a, a, a guy in Minnesota named Mark Hirsch put together a while back. And basically he sort of fell in love with this bur oak tree that he drove by every day for work and decided that he was going to photograph this tree with his iPhone every day for a year and made a, a little coffee table book and sells prints of those uh, photos on his website as well. And I, I messed up on getting the photos on the front side here, but I shared a couple of photos he shared of, you know, the, the different invertebrates that, that make their home in this tree, the cornfield context of the bur oak. This is a tree that's adapted to growing as an individual in a savanna type of situation, the same way that trees in the African illustrations that I showed you earlier are. So when you see a picture of this bur oak in wintertime, my hope is that you're able to identify good structure in this tree by the end of this presentation. And as you look around at trees around you, you can more easily identify those red flags that need to be addressed and the trees that are doing great and really need very little intervention by us. So ultimately, making a long story much shorter, we prune trees in the city in order to minimize defects and get a structure that's more like what they would naturally develop in order to minimize those defects. So um, I'm gonna couch all the terminology and that sort of thing in the larger conversation about structural pruning. Structural pruning is the term that the book uses. And so I do my best to always stay with the terminology that ISA uses because that will serve you best on the test. 
with a structural pruning practice, what we're really doing is establishing good structure in our trees early on. This is a ex perfect example of how an ounce of prevention is truly worth a pound of cure. You can be hands off with the trees that you manage and simply manage failures as they occur. Or you can, with a lot less time and labor and money, establish good structure in these trees early on and save yourself a lot of headache down the road and manage risk much more responsibly. So there are three steps to this process. The first one is we're gonna set our objectives. What are we trying to accomplish? When we look at a tree or we're asked to evaluate a tree or give a bid on a tree by a customer, oftentimes the homeowner just sort of has a sense that the tree needs pruning. They might be right, they might be wrong, uh, but, but they have an objective in mind and that may or may not jive with what's best for the tree. And that's sort of a, a whole other social topic to cover sometime as far as managing customer expectations versus doing right by the trees that you manage on their behalf. So for pruning objectives, there's a handful here. Just about anything you come up with probably falls underneath these. Reducing the potential of a, uh, for a tree or branch to fail. This is really where we're talking about, um, you know, minimizing the, the poor structure that trees develop when they're in a, this new urban context. And then improving a view, improving aesthetics. This is more often what drives a customer calling you about their tree. They don't like the way the tree looks. And again, they might be right about intervention being needed. They might be completely off in terms of what they expect versus what it would be best for the tree. But these bottom two are usually what's driving most of the requests as opposed to most of the need being about minimizing risk and the likelihood of failure. Graham? Yes. Emily uh, is asking, doesn't the ANSI standards still recommend that you have a third trunk and two third branch canopy? A third trunk? Say that again? Your proportion. So in a tree's entire size, one third of that should be the trunk and two thirds of it should be the canopy. I'm and sure. they're still recommending that. As far as I'm aware, it is. That is what it, that's what's still in the book. I, okay. I didn't mean to interrupt things. I just saw in that last slide that those trees were like pruned up so high, it was kind of nuts for their size. Right here? Yeah. Yeah. and and. You know, that's where we're always balancing the needs of people versus the needs of tree and because the the tree would prefer to have oh okay so what you're talking about is live crown ratio um yes if we look at the whole height of the tree at least two-thirds of that should have foliage on it and and right. I, I i wasn't getting to that with the original wording but yes that is still the ANSI 300 standard and i uh, definitely hammer home the importance of those those manuals uh, later on in the PowerPoint. In this case, though, we have a parking lot situation where we do have clearance issues. It could be that this is an ornamental species that never gets big enough to be a good choice for this location. But it, uh, and we certainly are a little bit below that 60% live crown ratio that we want to have. But uh, yeah, yeah, that was a good point, Em. Thank you. Um, so uh, other reasons here, uh, shade and wind resistance, ma maintaining the health of the tree. Sometimes we're pruning to have some effect on fruit and flower production, certainly with fruit trees that Chrissy talked about before. We don't want to let every single branch grow on a fruit tree and get loaded with fruit and snap off. The tree's spreading its energy too thin amongst too many fruits, and uh, we get better quality and, and uh, harvest when we um, thin the tree a little bit and, and limit that fruit production to, to a fewer number of branches that are stronger. So these are some of those objectives, but when we're, um, you know, and we certainly want to talk about the branch collar and we'll look at that again a little bit where the arrows are, are indicating here. As, as far as reducing risk and the likelihood of failure though, we have three basic objectives. So we're going to address co-dominant stems meaning stems that are roughly the same size where they are branching from each other. 
we're going to address bark inclusion and we're going to address bark inclusion in as much as it's actually affecting the strength of the uh, branch attachment and those unbalanced canopies. So as I said earlier, a lot of credit to, for some of these slides goes to Ed Gilman, who's out of Florida, where they have hurricane winds. This unbalanced canopy thing is a little bit more of a priority there, where they have winds that are stronger, but lower duration, whereas we tend to have wind storms that are sustained over longer periods of time, but slower. You know, we had, what, 50, 60 mile an hour winds recently, but certainly not 120, 130 mile an hour winds that you can see with hurricanes. So Ed really likes to emphasize that canopy balance a little bit more than we tend to here in the Midwest, but it's still an, an important factor. Um, on, the, on the right side here, we can see on the top a tree with co-dominant stems. If we picture that you know, head of broccoli that you buy at the grocery store, that's, that's what co-dominance really looks like in a tree. Bark inclusion, as shown here, is where we have two branches that are continuing to get thicker and smash against each other. And it's, it, it's counterintuitive to most people, but this does not magically fuse together and create strength. That bark touching other bark never changes. And so we have a weak branch attachment that actually only converges somewhere down here below where the bark, branch bark ridge starts to set in. And the, this branch on the right is going to continue to get longer and heavier with more forces acting on it. And the attachment of that branch is not going to proportionally keep up with those forces. And so that's where our likelihood of failure really goes up in that uh, included bark situation. And bark inclusion is much more common when we have co-dominant stems because we don't have a single leader driving the growth of the tree and then subordinated branches off to the side that are not being allowed to grow as, as long and thick and heavy. So when those failures occur, this really dark place in here that we can see is all of the included bark that was not actually wood attached properly. Ash is one that, that this happens a lot. Ash is a, a decurrent growth type. So trees that have a decurrent growth type tend to have codominance to them. Codominance does not always mean a defect. Back east here, we can grow yellow wood, which is an example of a tree that kind of a smaller mature size. Uh, crab apples sometimes will have a lot of codominance in them but there are ornamental trees that don't have a mature size that poses any significant risk, but still may warrant a little bit of tip pruning to guide uh, a leader in. But the point is not to take all trees and make them look like pin oaks or white pines with a single trunk and lateral branches coming off to the side. The point is to intervene when we see defects, not to uh, make every round hole uh, fit the square peg idea of, of the strong leader with the subordinated branches. So here's more, what, what, more of what weak structure looks like. This should have been addressed 10, 15 years ago in both these cases. Usually when I show these slides, I'll get a hand go up in the audience and someone say, all right, Graham, what would you do for these trees? And I don't know that there's a good answer. Um, on the right side here, we could cut one of these off all the way. We don't have all the information we need to make good choices. We'd need to see the whole tree as well. But the other option is that we could subordinate one of these branches. Can anybody, anybody in the audience um, tell me a little bit about what subordination means? What do we mean by subordinating a branch? I wanna get you guys talking a little bit. Take on, taking down the possible less dominant of the leaders and cutting it back away so that it uh, doesn't try to grow along with the one you want to grow. Right, right. Excellent. What, so the tree, any tree is going to regulate how each of its branches grow independent of each other. 
And that's done through hormones that are moving throughout the tree and are allocated along with energy for growth itself. So every branch has a terminal bud at the very tippy tippy end of it. And everywhere it forks below that, there's a terminal bud there, along with lots of other buds, but every branch has a tip with a bud on it. In the case of uh, uh, lilacs and others, you might have two instead of just one. But the point remains that these terminal buds are actually regulating hormones that move through the tree. And so if we take a branch that's got a poor attachment to it, like we see here, and we take off some amount of the top of that branch, and we take some number of terminal buds away from that branch, then we're not only impacting the length and the weight of that branch, but we're impacting its future growth rate as well. That branch that we've cut back has now been subordinated to a slower growth rate so that in this case, if we wanted to subordinate the right side, eventually maybe this left side could, could reestablish itself as the leader in the tree and um, reduce the likelihood of this failure occurring where we had this kind of wishbone with lots of bark inclusion and a really weak attachment that might not start until somewhere down here. So by taking the weight off of the, the included branch, we're reducing its likelihood of failure now. And by taking some amount of terminal buds away from that branch, we're also continuing to suppress its growth so that it continues to be less likely and doesn't continue to grow at the same rate as the one on the left side. So as we revisit my, my Linden friend here, and we think about uh, branch angles, do we have anything in this canopy that we need to be concerned about as far as the angle of attachment of that branch? Not, don't think about anything else because we'll revisit this tree a couple times, but just branch angle alone, what do, is there anything that needs to be uh, uh, addressed? Anybody? Okay. Well, uh, I would say on the left side, we definitely have good branch attachment. If, um, if, if, uh, if my body is the trunk of a tree and I've got two branches growing, um, over here, my arm can continue to get thicker and thicker and my trunk can keep getting thicker and thicker and there's room for that to happen. Over here, eventually I have this branch getting thicker and my trunk getting thicker and it all gets smashed together. Okay, and I still am, am only attached back here where my where my shoulder is actually uh, tying into my chest. So I would say that we could address this branch on the right here. There's certainly some bark inclusion and that branch is going to continue to be more weakly attached if we don't do something to slow down its growth rate. So step two in structural pruning is to deter determine our pruning cycle and our pruning dose. So who would like to tell me about either pruning cycle, pruning dose, or both of them if you care to? What do we mean by cycle and dose? I would think cycle means the frequency of how often you're going to uh, prune that. Yeah, very good, Marianne. Yeah, and the dose would be how much you cut because you don't want to cut more than a third at a time. Right, right. So pruning cycle, we're saying how often or how frequently, as you said, and dose is how much. So exactly right, Marianna. So for pruning cycle, there are some considerations here. So the interval of time between every pruning event. So in a, in a perfect world, we'd all have plenty of money to pay certified, qualified, professional arborists to come uh, do a little bit of work on the trees very regularly. But the reality of the situation is that that's not usually very likely, whether you're a homeowner with a limited income or you're a, um, a municipality, you manage trees for the city and you only have so much labor dollars and time to put into the trees that are on the streets or on the schools and the courthouse and all that sort of thing. Resources are limited is the point. So your pruning cycle is going to depend, of course, on the quality of the nursery stock. 
if trees are being um, propagated poorly, they're root bound, they're going to struggle, they're not going to grow as fast. There are species specific growth rates. Of course, some trees grow faster than others, regardless of whether their root systems look like a ball of twine or spokes on a wagon wheel. The climate's going to be an issue, you know, down in Florida where Ed Gilman's at, they have a longer growing season. So trees put on more biomass any given year than they would up here in more temperate climates. So down in Florida, of course, your pruning cycle is going to have to be more frequent because the trees are growing more with each given year. And then, of course, you know, site specific situations, uh, how, how much are they on the north side of a building, uh, getting shade from a high rise most of the day, all these things sort of things are going to impact how quickly a tree grows and how frequently they need to be pruned. So this is where the, the general public loves fast growing trees, while those of us in the trade or managing trees for a municipality understand the downside or the, you know, the, the two edged sword of fast growing trees. A longer pruning cycle. So knowing that pruning cycle can change and it's based not just on the needs of the tree, but also the resources that we have available. A longer pruning cycle means that you're going to make bigger cuts in order to achieve your objectives. So this is the trade off. This is another reason why fast growing trees often are not good to have a lot of around the city because fast growing trees tend to be worse at compartmentalizing decay and stopping it from spreading into the stem of the tree. Not always. There are fast growing trees that can be good at, at uh, uh, preventing decay from moving. But the larger the cuts we make, obviously, the more likelihood of decay becoming an issue for the rest of the trunk of the tree. So for pruning dose, as Mariana said, that's the amount of live tissue we're taking away from the tree in one visit. So this doesn't mean what we're going to take off all the time if we're going to be really heavy handed with the tree throughout its life, but just on this visit, as we set our objectives, determine our pruning cycle and dose, and then go do the work, how much is coming off today? So a low pruning dose is under about 20% of all the live foliage that the tree has. And a higher pruning dose is, you know, this is just a general rule of thumb, 20% uh, isn't a hard and fast number. But generally speaking, um, over about 20% and you're getting into a higher pruning dose. Now that a higher pruning dose doesn't mean um, inappropriate. It doesn't mean aggressive or too much. It just means on the higher side of an appropriate amount of pruning for a single visit. So mature trees or trees that have just been in the ground for a growing season or two really want to stick to a lower pruning dose on trees like that, If especially really overly mature trees are not going to like to be aggressively pruned. Younger trees that are getting established and are in a vigorous state of growth are going to be able to tolerate a bit more pruning. Um, so I mentioned most of these other things here. Uh, we'll look at a tree here that Ed uses to, to demonstrate that. This is about 30%, 25 to 30% taken out of the tree. And that was done with five pruning cuts. Okay. Now we see a lot of daylight through the tree now, but that's still only about about a third of, of the, the foliage taken off of the tree. I'd say, you know, closer to 25%. There's still a lot of foliage on this tree. Um, so it's worth pointing out that when we prune trees, we are not only taking away their photosynthetic capacity by taking foliage away, but we're also taking away stored energy that they've put into the branches. While it is true that sap flow moves stored energy into the root system in fall for dormancy, there is a lot of energy that's stored up in the canopy in the branches in that woody tissue as well. So we're taking away money that tree has saved over time, you know, back to the analogy of the root system being the bank account and the top being the bills. 
There's a lot of uh, bank account in the branches as well. So we are taking away stored energy that has been made in the past, as well as the leaves that it uses to continue to make that energy. So that that's driving a lot of why we try to limit how much is taken off a tree at any one time. So the third step in structural pruning approach is of course to go do the dang work, right? Make good cuts. When you are a property manager, you're gonna prioritize trees that have the worst issues, knowing that again, that resources are limited and you're not gonna be able to do everything that you want to your trees every time you go out. And then finally, this concept of temporary versus permanent branch management. We'll talk about that a little bit too. So making good cuts, there are a couple types of pruning cuts that the book discusses. Reduction cuts is where we are taking the leader of a branch out and cutting back to a lateral. The general rule of thumb is we wanna cut back to a lateral that's at least a third the size of what we're cutting off. And then a removal cut or a thinning cut as the, as the book calls it, is where we're cutting the lateral off instead and leaving the main leader of the branch still intact. So there, uh, this is where we have a branch collar to consider not uh, impacting uh, rather than up here where we're cutting back to the branch bark ridge. Um, so I have these little circles that I put in here. The lighter colored circle, again, showing the pruning cut versus the green circle being the, the new leader the branch that's left behind after the work's done and comparing the difference between the two. So we can see that with a reduction cut, we're taking off a larger branch and cutting back to a small one. Whereas with a removal cut, we're cutting off something pretty small and leaving the, the branch leader intact. So this has all the implications that I mentioned on the last slide about how much stored energy we're taking away, how much foliage we're taking away But the point is we wanna do our best to minimize making really big cuts because if, as we talked about, uh, Lori discussed code it a bit. So I, did, I took the, my code it slides out of here because we did talk about that already. Decay moves quickest in trees vertically. So those big cuts that you make on a tree like beech, of course, we're not blessed to, to grow big beeches like this here in Nebraska, but if we did, it's not a very good tree at compartmentalizing decay. And so when we make really big cuts on it, that can manifest as butt rot down below on the ground. If we're smashing into the base of the tree with the lawnmower every week, then that can manifest as dieback in the top of the tree. Vertically means both up and down downward movement. Anybody, can anybody tell me why decay would move quickest in trees up and down the trunk? because water movement and food movement is up and down in the trunk. So you've got this vertical movement already going. Yeah, yeah. The tree already has the infrastructure in place to move water and photosynthates up and down the tree. So that there's these, these vessels in the wood that are already making that movement happen. So of course, decay fungi, the spores that are all around us right now. I mean, it's winter time, so there's probably less, if any, but they're omnipresent. There's always decay fungi floating around the air. The second that your saw goes through that cut and takes the branch off, decay fungi are settling on that wound, which is part of why, as we'll talk about later, the wound dressings are uh, very minimally effective and only in very specific circumstances. So if we can achieve our objectives for a tree with smaller pruning cuts, we would be very smart to do so because the bigger the tree uh, the bigger the cuts on the tree, the more likely that decay is going to set in and then move into the whole tree and compromise its uh, structural integrity over the long term. Trees do not heal, guys. Trees only seal over wounds. They make do without. And Lori really drove that point home with her Titanic analogy, the, the submarine or the, or the boat. You get a hole in the submarine you close off the hatches that are that are attached to that hole 
and allow that particular compartment to fill with water because there's nothing you can do about it. But just like a submarine, a tree is going to do its best to prevent that decay from moving into the, the other compartments outside uh, adjacent to where the, the, the wound is. So beech is not very good at, at sealing those hatches up to prevent that from happening. Other trees much better at it. So this, this is why subordinating branches is something that should be considered more often as opposed to just cutting a, a problematic branch all the way back to the stem because we can minimize the chance of decay in the tree and still minimize the likelihood of a branch union failing without cutting all the way back to where that, that weak attachment is. So all trees develop a collar of some sort where, where they fork. They're gonna be more obvious in some trees than others. But what's really important to note is that in the collar of a tree, you have the annual growth rings from the trunk and the growth rings from the branch and they're locking together to form a really strong attachment so that that, so that branch doesn't snap off. So if we cut into this collar that we see here, we're cutting into the trunk of the tree and we're cutting into the annual growth rings that extend up to interlock with, with the branch rings to create that strength. And that's why we're gonna leave that collar intact and not cut into it because that, again, if we were to cut this as if there was never a branch there before, first of all, it's a much bigger cut, it's a much bigger wound, but then it's also compromised the wood of the trunk itself rather than just cutting into growth rings from the branch, okay? Any questions there or comments or things you've experienced in the field along these lines? I see the chat popping off a little bit here and there, Chrissy, so I don't know if I need to address anything, but we can just keep rolling. Uh, but the flush cuts were a thing that uh, were pretty common. I think we're, as an industry, we're doing good about getting away from it. It's the, it's the, uh, the folks that have a lawn service that sort of get dragged into tree work because there's the demand for it without having the, the knowledge and experience to do right that um, kind of perpetuate that process. But flush cutting, just a bit of trivia, flush cutting initiated, it, it, it originated from chainsaws. Before we had chainsaws, the, there weren't flush cuts being made because we had small hand tools that could be, um, that could get into a branch crotch and cut that at an appropriate angle. But when you got a bit, real wide chainsaw bar and a tight branch angle, you don't have the space that you need to tip that, that uh, chainsaw at an angle. Otherwise, you're just going to end up cutting into the trunk of the tree with the top side of the chainsaw bar. So um, I'm sure there were flush cuts being done prior to chainsaws, but it really became something that we just sort of threw up our hands about how are we not going to do that once chainsaw work became kind of synonymous with arboriculture. So um, we're, we're, we're cutting at the collar. Usually the collar can be easily identified by the branch sort of going from a uniform thickness to uh, flaring out sort of like the, at the base of the tree itself. But it's not always gonna be real obvious like it is in these pictures that I'm showing. So that's where your experience is gonna play into doing a good job. So there's this three cut method. And here again, I don't like this diagram because we're also cutting at an angle that I'm not very comfortable with in terms of the keeping the leaving the collar intact, but just splitting hairs there. So three cut method, you guys use this a lot. Who does, can someone describe to me what this is all about? What are we doing here? Um, this is Philip. I used the three cut method to get rid of the weight out there, and then I would leave that final cut, and I'd make it a cut with only about two inches of that branch. Right, right. Yeah, so so in this, thank you for sharing that, and I agree with you. In this case, we're using step three to do that, that stub cleanup that you mentioned, but that could certainly be a fourth cut instead. That's what I'd do. I'd make it a fourth cut. Okay, that, that's good. To, that's good to know. And I, there's 
certainly nothing wrong with getting this accomplished safely and you know really taking your time but the point of all this is that we want to start with this undercut that's not going to go all the way through the branch we're just putting a cut here that's going to intercept any sort of tearing that might occur once we go to take most of the weight off of the branch with our second cut and then uh, whether it's the third or the fourth cut that you come back now we have just a little bit of a stub left without a lot of weight to it so we can do a really good cut right at the branch collar to minimize the likelihood of cutting into the collar or having a tear that comes all the way through the collar and oftentimes is ripping uh, bark and live tissue off the trunk of the tree itself. If you've got a branch that's smaller and doesn't weigh a lot, then certainly just prop that uh, the weight of the branch with your own arm if you want to. Um, this works for hand saws, but of course with chainsaw work, uh, ANSI 300 and the Z133 tell us to keep all hands on the chainsaw whenever the chainsaw is op being operated. So we shouldn't have a hand free to hold another branch if we're using a chainsaw. I don't know exactly why this is. I'm sure it has something to do with the architecture of the rings and how they're arranged. But whenever cuts are too flush, or they're into the collar, it's really telltale to have poor wound closure on the top and the bottom sides. And usually you get pretty good response wood on the sides, but the top and bottom is typically where we won't see good uh, response and callus wood forming when we've cut too far into the, the collar of the tree. So what's really valuable to you as an arborist is to have the opportunity to revisit the work that you do and evaluate the tree's response to it. If you have land and you can find a mulberry or something like that growing along a fence line, go abuse that tree. Go hack away at it and uh, do crazy things to it to see how it responds. Because if it's out in the middle of nowhere, it's not a risk to anybody, um, that, that will be a real big learning experience for you. Uh, if you need more information about how trees are going to respond to different treatments and different pruning approaches. Another analogy that Ed Gilman likes to use in these PowerPoints is the water balloon. If we are pruning lateral branches like these red arrows, we are squeezing the water balloon and pushing its growth energy into the top. And the opposite is true, of course, when, when a storm takes out the top of a tree and we end up having a tree that goes really lateral like a tabletop because we've, so the, the storm has, if you will, support, subordinated the leader that the tree had. And now all these laterals that are below it have now been increased in their hierarchy of resources. And so they're getting more energy to grow because the leader is not there any longer. So that water balloon analogy works pretty well for picturing how you're guiding the growth of a tree into the future. So in this case, we got a tree in a, in a field nursery. It's got three co-dominant leaders to it. If, as if we look at the attachment down here, these are all the same size. We would like to have this single leader get the chance to continue to get thicker than the other two and longer and continue to guide the growth of the tree so that it doesn't turn into a big green lollipop. So we could take those branches all the way out, but that would not be desirable uh, aesthetically for selling it in the nursery when it gets dug out of the field or desirable for the tree, which could uh, we could accomplish our goals by simply cutting those branches back to appropriate laterals in order to minimize the size of the cuts that we're making you know, we'd make a much bigger cut if we were cutting down here and we would be taking more energy and photosynthetic capacity away from the tree. And then of course, having this really ridiculous looking structure, if we were to cut both of these branches all the way to the trunk, leave these little laterals down below. Um, this is a point to be made specifically about street trees. As I said, I'm couching all this within an urban context and managing trees in the city. When you plant trees on the street, even a $400 three inch 12 foot tall B&B &B tree 
every branch on that tree is temporary because you need at least 14 foot clearance on the street side so the UPS trucks and the school buses don't rip those branches off. And usually the city will go ahead and symmetrically do that on the sidewalk side, although typically ordinance only requires about eight foot clearance um, on the sidewalk side of the tree. So that 12 foot tall tree has only branches that are temporary if it's on the street. Of course, park plantings, backyard plantings, you know, all that goes out the window, but it still drives home the point of temporary versus permanent branch management. Because we can manage trees or we can manage branches on a tree temporarily, knowing that we're going to cut them off later. But that doesn't mean that we cut them all off now. That 12 foot, that $400 tree does not want all its temporary branches cut off at planting time, right? Still needs to grow and store, create energy, store it, establish in the ground before it's going to continue to grow. So it'd be silly to take all temporary branches off right away or early on in the tree's life. Um, Graham, do you want to go back one slide and cover the value? What of these twigs on the bottom? What are they doing oh, to that tree? Yeah, thank you. So by by putting a a radioactive gas in a plastic bag and wrapping that around a branch of a tree, we can we can trace the photosynthates that that branch produces and see where the tree stores that energy. And what research shows is that the energy that's created by lower branches contributes to trunk taper in the tree. And the energy that's produced higher up in the canopy is stored in the branches and, and doesn't impact that, that trunk taper as much. And so when we manage those really low branches temporarily, knowing that they're gonna have to come off down the road, we're giving the tree the opportunity to put energy into that trunk taper that's going to give it a better structure down the road. I think that's what Chrissy was was getting at a little bit. Yeah, I had a comment earlier in the chat that when a homeowner wants to limb up their tree, you can instead recommend a minimum six foot mulch ring that's easier for them to turn around with a mower anyways, and then just you know, shorten those branches to be inside the circle so that way they can help build that taper, of, especially on young trees. Right. And, 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 and the, the, the mulch thing doesn't necessarily address a pruning objective, but it could address an objective that the homeowner has, which is, I don't want my face ripped off by the tree when I'm cutting the grass. Um, one answer, of course, is a pruning objective. The other answer is a design solution where we can separate the turf and tree interface a little bit in order to solve the problem without uh, excessive pruning. But, but lower branches can just be subordinated so that their growth rate is slowed down, but not uh, taken down to zero by cutting the branch off all the way. And this is often usually uh, fairly non-intensive work to do. It doesn't take a lot of time to subordinate these low lateral branches. They're right there on the ground. You don't have to throw a rope up in the tree and take 10 minutes to get situated up in a big tall shade tree. You can do this kind of work pretty safely from the ground and it's really going to pay dividends for the tree's long-term viability and uh, you know not cost a lot of time or money. Thanks Chrissy. Um, this slide I think is a little out of order because we talked about branch size earlier so I'll uh, fix that for the evening session. But when we're looking at the branch size and we're looking up and down the trunk of the tree, we want to be comparing the, the, the thickness of the trunk at a branch attachment to the thickness of the branch coming off of that attachment. So when we have a lateral that's less than half the trunk diameter, then there's very little at stake if we want to take that branch off all the way, right? This is a fairly unimportant branch. It, it's not very thick and long with a lot of foliage. And so completely removing it probably has very few consequences to the tree. And so if removal is being considered, then that's probably a pretty safe thing to do if you decide that that's the approach you want to go. 
when we get more a third to a half the trunk diameter, then there's likely to be some, some included bark. Um, and you should consider shortening that branch instead of cutting it all the way out. Now you may be saying, well, Graham, why am I only cutting off branches all the way when there's not defects? And when we have a potential for some defects there, we're only shortening it. And that's partially because when you have that bark inclusion, it's very difficult to even determine an appropriate place to cut that branch all the way off at particularly because you're very likely to damage adjacent tissue of the trunk or leave a stub anyways, even though you're trying to get it all the way back to where the attachment actually originates. So it's very invasive to cut a, a included branch all the way back to where it comes out of, the, out of the trunk. So shortening it usually does everything we need to do in terms of limiting the likelihood of, of that branch snapping out right at that location, right? We can take off weight and length without trying to get involved in this messy area where the bark inclusion is. Now, if we got a branch that's over half the trunk diameter, the likelihood of there being defects there only increases. And so the subordination approach becomes even more likely rather than trying to take the branch out altogether. Hey, Graham. Yes. Kent, Kent asks, should the first line be a third instead of a half inch? Uh, probably. Less than a third the trunk diameter. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, the same way I can give Ed Gilman credit, I can also point to him when there's a, when there's a mistake. So, <laughs> uh, rather than taking personal credit for that, I will go ahead and change it. Thank you, Kent. That's a good observation there where uh, less than half the trunk uh, doesn't make sense in the continuum of getting bigger uh, as we go further down the chart. You should have been a private detective, I think. <laughs> so now we're back to this linden tree again. When we're just looking at branch size, do we have any branches that are of concern in their size compared to the size of the trunk of the tree. Feel free to unmute yourself and weigh in with your thoughts. How about I ask a more specific question then? Do we have any lateral branches that are over a third of the diameter of the trunk? No, no, we don't. Um, there are, oh, I thought there was a little more to, to dial in there, but every branch that we look at, at the point where they originate out of the ground, I mean, this branch here is maybe, maybe 20%, you know, a fifth of the diameter of the trunk right here. We go higher up in the tree and we have a smaller trunk diameter, but still a good proportion between the, uh, the diameter of the lateral and the, uh, the trunk where it attaches. Another thing worth considering here is branch spacing along the trunk. We do have a pretty good leader established here. If there were branches that were originating from the trunk too close together to allow them both to get thicker, we would want to pick and choose which of those we wanted to allow to be permanent branches as well. So when you're evaluating a tree for pruning needs, as far as branch spacing goes, you would just wanna be thinking about how big is this branch gonna get over time? And is there another branch that's gonna interfere in it being, being able to achieve that size? Because you can get bark inclusion between branches, just like you would between the branch and the, the, the stem of the tree. So this is where we talk about lion tailing most of you are probably familiar with this term and, and know better. We also have a, a, a really disgusting looking pruning cut down here. It looks like a flush cut, a huge cut for the size of the branch that was probably removed um, when that cut was made. So this is where just like a lion tail, we're leaving small tufts of live foliage at the ends of branches and taking out all the interior growth. Sometimes this is sold to homeowners as canopy cleaning 
Uh, regardless, it's garbage. This is not good arbor culture and should not be done to trees at all um, for a couple reasons. Um, as Ed Gilman points out, uh, wind damage um, is more likely with trees that have been done this way. Sure, you, have, you do have winds passing through the canopy, but the wind forces that do act on these branches are being concentrated on smaller parts of the branch where they're thinner and more likely to break off rather than having foliage distribution throughout the length of the branch that allows the wind force to be distributed more evenly throughout. Uh, this is also difficult to restore as we'll see in this next picture. If, you know, why does a tree need to be elevated to 45 feet off the ground? I have no idea. This is just, again, awful practices. The other challenge that this creates is that as an arborist, if any of these branches breaks, you have no laterals to cut back to. And your only option in most cases on these branches is to cut all the way back to the stem, taking a lot of stored energy from the branches, a lot of photosynthetic capacity from the leaves that are coming off and leaving a, a Charlie Brown looking structure behind. So um, don't do this. Graham, what do you say to a homeowner that wants it? Um, you know, that gets back to the whole social discussion of managing people when trees are what we're talking about. There's what's good for the tree and then there's what the your homeowner wants and they have cash in hand. They want you to do the work and you can walk away, but someone else is going to get that money. So that becomes an ethical consideration uh, for you as a as a business owner. What kind of work you want your business associated with? And whether uh, you know the quick buck is worth it to compromise the ethics uh, that you will, you know, as you go for certification and take the test and pass the test, you will sign a, a code of ethics agreement that uh, we all, as certified arborists, are obliged to hold each other to. And if you see uh, regular offenders doing this sort of practice. Uh, in some ways, you're obliged to to make that known to the certification body that uh, that that's going on. Anything else to in the chat about this, Chrissy? Uh, Marianne says that about 20 years ago, our neighbor had uh, his poplar tree lion tailed, and now it's 99% dead and ready to fall over. Oh yeah, and poplar's another one. That tree does not stop decay. You know, you start hacking away, making big cuts on poplar it will get decay spreading throughout. It will get a lot of vigorous epicormic shoots coming off of it. Um, and that, that's just a recipe for disaster. Some species may allow you to get away with doing this sort of thing with fewer consequences to the tree over time, um, but it's always a bad idea. I, I think we talked about this a little bit in one of Chrissy's presentations earlier on in the workshop series, but trees actually like to have some leaves in the shade. They don't want every single leaf in full sun all the time. Um, so as some of you that maybe climb trees are aware, if you excessively lion tail a tree like this and, and blow open the interior of the canopy, some thinner barked trees like maples can actually get sun scald on the top sides of the branches where um, it's just not visible to the homeowner um, months later when it occurs after the work's done. But those climbers that are up in trees all the time will notice sun scald in trees that have uh, been blown open like this one. So lots of reasons not to do it. And on the other end of the spectrum, of course, is topping, or as ISA manual, they refer to this as a heading cut, where you're arbitrarily cutting branch leaders back to inner nodes. As, as Lori talked about um, meristems, and where the nodes and the growing points are. An internode, of course, is a location in between nodes. So if we're gonna cut a tree back to arbitrary points just because it's starting to conflict with a power line, of course, what? The, yeah, and again, this is garbage. This is not something to be done. If I'm out about in, uh, in Lincoln or Omaha or somewhere else in the state and I drive by and see you doing this, I will not doing anything about it, but I will be very disappointed in you. <laughs> um, 
But when you do this kind of work, this is where all the epicormic growth occurs. There was no leaf bud. The tree was not planning on a branch at this location. It initiated a dormant bud that was just sitting there in the wood because it had no photosynthetic capacity left. It had no leaves to, to make energy with, and it will be damn sure that it's going to get some new ones going with all the energy that has been stored uh, in this root system and, and the trunks and branches of this elm here um, over the years that it's been alive. And those epicormic sprouts have hardly no connection. I mean, oh, yeah. the, the connection to that branch is minimal. You think about back to when grandma's talking about the, the bark branch ridge and the, the collar. I mean, these, they're all just trying to come out of one spot. I mean, if you were to try and push them, I mean, they would probably just pop off the end. Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, bark inclusion, I mean, this is probably one or two years growth and we've already got all these branches smashed together. So even if you wanted to go through and thin these back and choose new permanent, you know, canopy branches, you'd still have really poor attachment. Decay is setting in on this pruning cut that was made and that's gonna be continuing to spread throughout where all this is attached. So it's just a mess. Um, in all likelihood, this is just a cheaper uh, attempt to keep the integrity of the power line in place without just taking the whole thing down. So don't do it. So back to my earlier point about branch management for temporary versus permanent. In this diagram here, we have a tree that's just been planted. Again, if it, this, this all branches temporary is, is strictly from a street tree standpoint, you can keep permanent uh, scaffold branches lower than this, but uh, this PowerPoint's usually given in the context of that, that street tree setting. So yeah, we, we can, with these dotted lines, we can see some pruning that was done early on to keep that single leader established and not get a fork going. That allows this, this one uh, central trunk to continue to guide the way for the tree to grow. You know, years, years later, we're doing a few more cuts. Again, in this case, we're subordinating this branch without cutting it all the way off. We're taking the, the leader out to slow it down, take more terminal buds out of that branch and slow it down at a greater rate than if we cut off some of these laterals and keep that leader established. And then by the time we're getting into 20, 30, 40 years, of growth out of the tree, we have our, our lowest permanent scaffold branch and, and onwards up. So when we look at this more long-term, uh, Ed Gilman and I both agree that young tree pruning is typically the first four or five decades that a tree is alive. So that first five years, we're not taking more than about a third of the live foliage at, at, in one visit. We're going to slow down any branches more than half the trunk diameter. We're going to reduce and or remove any branches competing with the one selected to be the leader. Even if they're not greater than half the trunk diameter, we'll, we can slow them down with pruning in order to make sure that that ratio and that proportion to its laterals remains. Reduce or remove large, low, vigorous branches, right? So this gets back to temporary branch management, knowing that either we need to take that branch all the way off later, or even if we're not going to take it off, we need it to grow slower so that it doesn't develop um, a big, thick growth rate that's going to be a problem down the road. And then, of course, remove anything broken, cracked, or severely damaged. And my little trees are encroaching a little bit on the text there. Five to 20 years, we're going to back off a little bit on the pruning dose, but not much. Um, a lot of the same concepts still apply. Um, but now we're starting to think about those, those permanent branches, identifying where our scaffold branches are located and bearing those in mind as we visualize what we're trying to accomplish, what our objectives are for the tree. 
and we're going to reduce, slow down any of them that are aggressive and growing lower. Slow down any with it with bark inclusion. 20 to 30 years. Now we're actually choosing those scaffold limbs rather than just kind of having an idea of which ones will probably be the permanent structure for the tree. Um, we're, look, we're starting to look at that branch spacing that I mentioned earlier. But most of the concepts all carry through. Uh, the book does talk about palms. So uh, I put palms at the very end of this presentation where they belong. Palms are not trees. Uh, they are monocots more closely related to grasses from an evolutionary standpoint. They do not have vascular tissue arrangement the same as trees. Um, it is, and I don't know a lot about it, of course, but we don't have this very distinct cambial layer right underneath the bark. This palms do not even really have bark per se. Um, so even though they don't have cambial layer right underneath the bark, we're still not using spikes to climb that and, and just do maintenance on it, just like any other tree. Um, you want to avoid move, removing any fronds that are still green and healthy. These are few in number, and so the palm is going to need as many of those fronds intact as possible. Uh, the picture you see here on the right is poor work. This is just like lion tailing or, or heading cuts. This is garbage arboriculture and not how palms should be treated. Remove fronds from the top down, only pr prune from below horizontal. So what that means is that if we're pruning off healthy fronds, we're only taking off any that are hanging lower than this zero degree uh, line that we can sort of articulate right here. Now, I mean, we could talk a little bit more about palms. None of us are probably directly involved in ma maintaining them. Uh, but the, the dead fronds that are dried up are very flammable. Chainsaws can actually heat up and ignite dry fronds in the tree while you're tied into it, which is very inconvenient. inconvenient. Um, the tops of palms are also apartment buildings for all types of critters, um, rats, insects, and they are not gonna be very happy with you coming up and taking lots of these out all at once as you're doing maintenance on a palm. And the, the, the fronds that are being pruned off often tend to hang up with each other rather than falling off the tree one at a time. And you can easily get a couple hundred pounds worth of these fronds all accumulating before they finally fall out of the tree, which is part of why people are called out to cut them out of the tree in the first place to prevent the, the risk to the public. So. As far as the test and you know what you need to know about palms, that should cover cover it pretty well. You might get one or two questions about palms on the on the test, but ISA is aware that a lot of people are not involved in their management at all, and so they don't lean on it very heavily. When I was visiting San Diego, California, uh, last not last summer, the summer before, um, they had a bunch of street. Uh, crews that were out there in these big old bucket trucks and they had loppers that they were using to clean the fronds and they had like this huge area below them like the whole street blocked off for safety reasons just because of the giant mess that they have but I mean they just chop them and drop them and someone else comes back and picks them all up. Yeah if we get time I know there was a video going around social media of a guy he was all the way up in the top of this palm it was probably 60 feet tall I want to say 60 feet long because it was wasn't really all that tall because it was bending over so far and as he's taking the weight out of the top of it to to drop the tree he just takes this ride back and forth it's just terrifying um, right. so as far uh, as yeah sorry as far as oh. the exam goes um every exam from one to one like from one to the next is different they just do kind of a random draw um, out of different categories and sometimes you might I mean it's it's no different than like taking the ACT I mean you might get more geometry than trigonometry kind of thing um, you just don't mm -hmm. so it's 
important to review anything that's in the book. Um, yeah. And I think I covered, I mean, there's only like three, four paragraphs on palms in the book. So I think I covered most of that pretty well. Um, yeah, you might get one question on palms versus two or three, uh, but it's going to be over a pretty limited amount of information. I mean, ISA realizes they're an international organization and some of the content is very specific to place. And so uh, they're really going to hammer on the concepts that apply to everything much more than regionally specific data. So, um, oh yeah, so ANSI A300, I'm going to mention these in every talk that I give. You can get on TCIA's website and order these individually for all 10. They're 20 bucks a piece. Uh, it's the best 200 bucks you'll ever spend. And if you uh, bulk at the $200 uh, you know, price tag for these manuals, um, then you will certainly not like whatever price tag is on some sort of court settlement for you doing bad work and getting uh, taken to task for it. So that's definitely an investment in uh, your future. So with a little time, we can go over the workbook questions if we like, or really just open it up to, to questions. Graham, I've got a question on the if you go back, can you get back to your linden tree? Of course. Go ahead and talk while I do that. Well, the, the, uh, there are two different branches that show up. They're smaller branches, but they go virtually straight up in the air. Ah, uh, right. Those, well, that one and then the one, yeah. Should and those probably couple. be at least subordinated? Yeah, yeah. Now they're they're not going to have any poor branch attachment because they are coming, you know, perpendicular off of this branch. So there's plenty of room for that branch to get thicker. But we sure could subordinate those. We're not going to even touch the pruning dose that we're capable of by taking those off. So there's no downside there. Um, so yeah, this gets back to the epicormic slash water sprouts discussion from Lori's talk. And you sure could be well within your rights and um, capability to do that without any serious problem to the tree. Okay, Un thank yeah. you. Now, Un if that was a fruit tree, those are definitely not branches that you want to try and manage fruit production on. And why is that, Chrissy? Because of the weight distribution, they end up like turning into a bow. They don't have enough taper and strength in the, the branch. So, okay, so you so you could reduce it though. Yes, you could, yes. Right, so again, small pruning cuts. Right. The smaller cuts you can use to achieve your goals, the better for the tree. And yeah. Scott wants to know um, if you have anything on pruning tools and how often do you clean them? And what products do you use to clean them? Yeah, yeah. 10% bleach is great to have on uh, your, your truck, you know, have it with you. You can certainly do that at the end of the day, every day. There are some situations where if you're pruning a diseased tree that can spread that disease to fresh cuts that you're making, then you're certainly going to want to sort of have that, that, that bleach spray on hand and be applying it more frequently to your pruning saw or your hand pruners, whatever you're using to prune with. Uh, I've, I've never heard anybody talk about sterilizing chainsaw chains and bars, if, if the same applies. Uh, I mean, they can certainly inoculate a wound with a disease organism just like a pruning saw, but I don't know if there's maybe a different product formulation or some another approach to sterilization for chainsaws. That that's a good question. I'll have to look into. Otherwise, like bypass pruners that are going to go past the blades, go past each other, um, opposed to anvil pruners. Yeah, anvil pruners pinch the tissue and cause more damage to the tissue that you leave behind, rather than a bypass pruner that that slides all the way through and across the branch like a pair of scissors. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what those anvil types are even good for. 
I don't know. There, there's, there's guys. Deadwood. Sorry. They're good for deadwood. Why is that? Um, they just, yeah, they just seem to cut better through deadwood. Hmm. Okay. I experienced that. Okay. So I suppose um, if you really want to have a separate pruning tool just for the deadwood, then then uh, maybe that that's good to know, Erin. I hadn't thought about that, and I'll look into it a little bit. Are you able to make fairly clean cuts uh, with the anvil for the deadwood? Like as far as like being able to get close enough to that collar, uh, but not too close. Sorry, could you say that again? Are you able to get an anvil pruner in close enough to be able to make like a nice clean cut um, on the outside of that collar without the stub? If I'm doing like a pruning, I'm in a pruning situation with anvil, I would probably pull out the saw, I guess. I usually, in my personal experience, I use the anvil for like, if I've felled a tree with dead wood on it, that way it just goes a lot faster. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, definitely my uh, recommendation is that when you're purchasing loppers, read how the size reading, the branch reading, and abide by it. Because otherwise you are going to pop a shoulder trying to cut something way too big that should have needed a, uh, a saw. Yeah. Use the base of the opening, not the tip. You're gonna tweak your um, equipment and shorten their lifespan if you keep using the, the tips to cut. You wanna always use whether it's a pruner or a lopper. Yeah, you're just working against yourself with the physics of the whole thing. If you're not getting the the piece you're pruning off all the way back there in the crotch of the of the pruning of the pruners, right. um, I, I've known probably half a dozen people that had um, long term forearm and and wrist problems either from using pruner pruners for branches that are too big, or for not keeping their saw chain sharp and their pushing with the chainsaw instead of allowing the chainsaw teeth to pull through the branch. Yeah. Um, Go ahead and put your um, CEU information in the chat, please. Oh, we didn't talk about growth regulators as well. That was in the chapter. Um, I'm not sure why it was in the pruning chapter other than it's used to kind of mitigate pruning, but there are hormone based products out there that are mostly used by the utility sector, but starting to be used a little bit more in urban agriculture, or arboriculture to uh, slow down the growth rate of trees and stimulate uh, fine feeder roots as well. So the uh, uh, Cambostat is the, the trade name of the one I'm most familiar with but I'm sure there's a number of them. Uh, what these are doing is using naturally uh, occurring hormones that the tree has in it to regulate growth and introducing those to tell the tree to do less uh, stem elongation and put more energy into the root system. And, and so that can be, have really good applications for trees that are imbalanced in root to shoot ratio They've done some studies where they treated street trees on one side of the street and not the other, and then blown the root, root system, you know, blown away the soil on the roots later. And you can really see the difference in uh, how the, the growth of the tree is guided by those. Graham, I'm going to steal your screen really fast. Uh, this yeah. is very important. So our next class is Tuesday, February 23rd. We do not have a 2 p.m. class. It is a 10 a.m. Central time. So you will have the option between either 10 a.m. Central or 5.30 p.m. Central. We have some internal training that day that we can't have all of our staff and two places at the same time, so. Yeah. So for, for those of you that are sharing a screen with multiple people, um, if we can get an idea of how many of you in the group are going for testing that will help us get you on our list of folks that are intending to test so that we can as i mentioned at the beginning kind of get you on our radar and establish a, a path of communication so that we can 
help you along with the process. So please send us any of that contact info if we didn't capture it in registration itself so that we can stay in touch with everybody. Yes, absolutely. So for on Tuesday, go ahead and um, review chapters 10 and 11, plant disorders, diagnosis, and plant health care. We'll have David Olson and he'll be able to chat all about that. So bring your questions. And, and, and my talk on Thursday on trees and construction is not an hour and a half long for sure. So I may talk to David about um, giving him some of my time on Thursday if he goes a little long because chapters 10 and 11 have a lot in them. So um, expect the potential for some of that content to carry over to Thursday. So um, yeah, I certainly don't need an hour and a half to cover construction protection. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Please get your uh, certification info in there and um,